the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello and welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson and with me, as you well know, B.J. Clark. B.J., always so good to be with you. It's good to work with you. Yes, sir. B.J., today we want to talk about the various trials of life. And I know that the Bible says in Job chapter 14, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And Trials are a part of life, and some trials can be worse than others. Uh, for some, it seems as if they have an avalanche of trials and tribulations in life. How do you counter those who say, you know what, if God really loved me, He wouldn't allow me to suffer like this? Yeah, that's very tough. I, I remember hearing about a preacher that walked into excuse me, a member of the church that walked into a preacher is the better way to say it, and said to him, I want to know where God was when my son died in Vietnam. And the preacher wisely responded, he was in the very same place he was when his son died on Calvary. The point being that God himself has suffered a sense of loss in the sense of watching his son die, his only begotten sure. son die. And in this world we're going to have tribulation, John 16, 33. But that's where we have to get back to why is that the case. You remember when God first laid it all out, it was a garden paradise with not an ounce or shred of trouble or pain in sight. It was man's deliberate sin that changed the whole equation. Sure. And that wasn't what God wanted. That's right. It's what man chose. And so every open grave that you and I ever walk to, every hurt that we suffer, connects back to the decision of men to choose sin instead of, uh, you know, what God said. And, and, and you know, B.J., that, that can be hard for people to, to process. Right. And, and to even accept. Sure. Uh, we go back to the Garden of Eden and we find the introduction of, of death, physical death, spiritual death, uh, the inception of pain and suffering. And if anything, there has been a proliferation of pain and suffering since the Garden of Eden. I, I, know, that, I, I know that there are some people who have been devastated mm. by loss. And, and I would grant that the various trials of life potentially could shake our faith. I, I think about Job. Job lost 10 children. I can't imagine losing one, much less 10. Uh, he lost a great deal of his wealth. Uh, then he lost his health. I mean, it's as if, as a matter of fact, there is a phrase common uh, to, to the writings of Job chapter one, while he was still speaking. Mm -hmm. It's as if one calamity happens, word comes, another one right on its heels. And so it would have been easy for those trials to have shaken his faith. And some people who are watching today are probably saying, you know what, based on where I am in my life, my faith has been shaken. How do you counter that? Right, well, part of it is what you just noted is to say, look, others have been through these difficult times and circumstances, but it came to pass. They were able to get through it with God's help a uh, preacher told me one time about a woman whose daughter came rushing into the house saying, you've got to come, Mama, Mama, come, because her brother had just been hit by a car while he was riding his bike. Now, the mother told the girl, you stay with the infant that she was giving a bath to. You stay right here with the baby. Don't leave the baby. Mama's going to go check on your brother. She went to check on the brother, and the little girl got so concerned about her brother, she thought she could leave the baby just for a moment. And, mm -hmm. and while she was rushing down the stairs to look out real quick and see how her brother was doing, she tripped, she fell down that entire flight of stairs. The baby unattended, drowned. The daughter 
died, That's the, the boy who was hit by the car died, and this mother, in one span of 15 to 20 minutes, mm. had lost all of her children. And as bad as that is, you and I think about Job losing 10 children all at once and then losing his health. And so sometimes I look at my own suffering to whatever degree I experience it. And I think there are folks who are going through even more trouble and trial than I am. Sure. And that encourages me to realize that I should pray for them and not just for myself. But it also lets me know that if others have overcome even greater degrees and amounts of suffering than I've experienced, that means when I go through my trials and valleys that I can get through those same things. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. He will sustain thee. Psalm 55, 22. God cares. He really does care about us. Uh, BJ, I, I think sometimes the pain that, that people experience in this life, and as you mentioned a moment ago, the family, the mother that lost three children, uh, it's hard to measure that kind of a loss, uh, somewhat like Job's. And yet Job would say in chapter 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I may not have all the answers, but I have to maintain my faith and allegiance in God and trust him, come what may. Uh, you know, Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. And I think, you know, to just be unwavering in my trust for God. Right. You, you mentioned the fact that that the Lord is there for us. He does indeed care. I, I'm reminded of the psalmist, David, in Psalm 142, when David said in verse 3, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, he said, then you knew my path and the way in which I walk. He said, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see. And then he says this, there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed for me, has failed me. No one cares for my soul. B.J., I think that there are some people, their faith has been shaken, and they, like David, feel as if no one cares for them, and that would be inclusive of God. And that amplifies the loneliness and magnifies it and makes it even harder to accept is because some people are going through trials alone, and then those trials seem to intensify, and they think, well, Paul did the same thing in 2 Timothy 4. He said, at my first defense, no, no stood. man stood with me. But then he said something that is encouraging. All men forsook me. No, that's not the encouraging part. He said, but the Lord stood with me right. and strengthened me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. And those aren't just empty words and platitudes that we say. We hurt with people. We should hurt for them and with them, cry with them, pray with them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who do weep, Romans 12. But here's the thing to realize is that what are the alternatives? If we get mad at God in the midst of our grief and say, that's it, I'm done with you, you've got what left? I was going to say, then what? Who do you have? Nobody. Now where are you going to go? Science is going to give you the magic cure for grief? No. What is the cure for grief? It it's, is, it's, it's not alcohol. It's no. not substance. No. Uh, uh, it's not something. It's not bitterness no. and anger. Uh, but, but to be able to channel that in a positive way, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think you're exactly Clinging right. Clinging to you? God. Well, you, you, you said it a minute ago, Proverbs, or rather Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord. You know, I think about Peter, casting all your care on him. Why, Peter? For he cares for you. And it's okay to have questions. Job had questions. Job was not criticized for wondering what was going on or why it was going on. The thing that Job at the end of the book puts his hand over his mouth and repents of is that he uttered some things that were too wonderful for him to, to really understand and process. He actually wanted to debate God about right. things right. and tell him kind of how to run the universe. And God says, okay, let me ask you a few questions, Job. And he starts rattling off 70 rapid fire questions to which Job knew the answer to not even one. And Job suddenly realizes, you know what? I'm out of my league here. I don't know what God knows. I think I'll just trust him. That's the thing about Job we admire. 
Job's patience is not the absence of a question or complaint. It's endurance. It's more of an endurance that says, I will never give up on believing that God will see me through this. I won't give yeah, up. Don't, don't you love what James said by way of commentary? James chapter 5, verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who, as you said, endure. You have heard the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And if, if Job is known for anything, it is that persevering spirit. And you know, Paul said in Romans chapter 5 that, that tribulation works patience or perseverance, mm -hmm. and perseverance, character, character, hope. And, and so it can be a building block. Right. in a sense, if we allow the trials and tribulations of life to, to serve in that capacity. What, what about somebody who may be watching today and, and they're thinking, okay, I have suffered immeasurably. My losses are incalculable. And, and as a result of that, I've lost my faith. And in losing my faith, I've lost my way. How do you counter somebody who right now is saying, I've lost everything? Yeah, we really need to be with them, Mike. Uh, words are not enough. Words alone won't get the job done. And sometimes it's better to just sit and be comforting by our presence than by our attempted. Were Job's friends the best thing they ever did for Job? Is spent seven days in silence with him. Right. Just you got to give them credit. They came from a long distance to be with Job in the midst of his suffering, but then they opened their mouths. And sometimes we think we're making things better when we say things, and really we're making things worse. I know uh, of a woman that suffered a miscarriage, and someone said to this person, well, at least you never really got to know the child and love it, oh, my. and that makes it easier because you don't have all those memories. Well, no. This mother never got to know the child that she carried, and it doesn't make it easier at all. We, or, you know, we, we say, well, they're in a better place. Well, that may be true may not be true dependent. We're not the judge of that. Jesus is. But I'll tell you this. We need to sometimes just hush and hold. That's right. Hug and, you know, just be there with a, a, a shoulder to cry on and, and to say, look, you're not the first one that's ever had questions and have temporarily lost your... If you read the... I would take... To get back to your main uh -huh. question... Yeah. I would tell someone who's going through that, look, just read the book of Psalms from beginning to end. And what you're going to find is people just like you right. who are having to almost give themselves a pep talk. They st these Psalms of lament start off with, God, I don't understand where you are. What's going on? Why are you letting this happen? And I'm all alone. And then it's almost as if the psalmist is saying, but wait a minute. I remember you blessed me in the past. You helped deliver these people. You've done this. God, I trust you. Your resume shows that you are the one I should trust. And that's the way these psalms often end in triumph, though they started in trouble. That's right. BJ, don't you think, I'm glad you brought up the psalms because in the book of Psalms, when I look at, at the various psalms, I see peaks and valleys yes. in the lives of people, particularly David. And, you know, it'd be great if, if every day was a mountaintop experience. Right. You know, like we're like Elijah, you know, we, we were the victor today. But the real truth of the matter is we probably spend more time in the valley than, than on the mountaintop. And so learning how to handle the ebb and flow of life, and, and in no way am I minimizing the pain and hurt and suffering that some people experience because I know that there are people who are suffering immensely. But I think the book of Psalms is yes. therapeutic. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, and, and as you said a moment ago, it, it can help rebuild a faith that has been broken down and destroyed. Uh, in Psalm 57, David in the long ago said, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. And then he says, My soul trusts in you. In the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge. When? until these calamities have passed me by. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we're in the midst of a heavy storm or downpour. Right. And, and, you know, like uh, the car that pulls to the side, pulls off underneath a bridge yeah. uh, to let the storm pass. Sometimes we need to look to God as that haven of shelter. That's right. Uh, you know, you mentioned something, Mike, that makes 
me want to say that if you look at most New Testaments that are sold today in any Bible bookstore, there will be one Old Testament book attached at the end, not because it was a part of the New Testament, but think about this. Why Psalms? There are 39 books in the Old Testament that are inspired of God. How did Psalms make that cut, so to speak, and get included into the back of our New Testaments and not Joshua? Joshua is a great book. Deuteronomy. <laughs> now, occasionally you'll see one that has Psalms and Proverbs right. both. But why Psalms more than any other book? And I think it's what you've hit on. It gets down to where we live, and it's about folks who are troubled, That's who right. need comfort. Psalm 23 is probably one of the most commonly quoted scriptures at a funeral That's of right. all scriptures in the entire Word of God. And listen to David there. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, claiming him as, as his shepherd, his protector, his guide, his comforter. And, and I think that in times of duress, that's what we need. Absolutely right. Yes, sir. BJ, what about maybe an, another dimension to this whole trials of life study? What, what about the benefits, the blessings the byproducts of human suffering. Now, I know somebody's probably thinking, you know, now wait a minute, that, that sounds far-fetched to me. But if I understand Scripture correctly, there are some benefits uh, to our human suffering. There's a dimension to what we face in this life can, that can ultimately aid us in our faith. So, so how do you counter those who say, you know what, uh, I don't buy that. In James chapter 1 verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, the trying of your faith, it works or produces patience, endurance, and you let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so according to Scripture, the trying of our faith produces an endurance. It actually helps us. Now, if I go to the gym and I start walking and I haven't exercised in quite a while, then that's going to hurt more than three, four weeks later when I'm walking four to seven miles a day on the treadmill or wherever it might be. And so there has to come a little pain to get the gain. Yeah. But once you get that gain, then you're able, you're stronger, you're more capable of handling the trials and troubles because you're kind of conditioned. Uh, Job is one book, but Jeremiah is another one that's interesting. Jeremiah was going through a lot. And here's the sad and harsh reality of what we're troubled with sometimes. It's only just begun, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Jeremiah in chapter 12 was told, If you've run with the footmen, yep. and they've wearied thee, how will you contend with horses? And Jeremiah starts that book chapter out by saying, Lord, you're righteous, but I don't understand what's going on here. And there's, there's a lot of suffering. His own countrymen, his own family had turned against him. He was accused of being a traitor because he preached the truth about what was going to happen in Babylonian captivity. Bottom line, though, is this. Jeremiah just kept clinging to God, and God gave him uh, the way and the means to get through it. And that's what we have to do is cling tenaciously to God. to God and know that He will see us through it, that there will be a calm after the storm. Well, excellent points. B.J., I can't help but think about the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the church, or in his letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, at verse 7, he talked about uh, the abundance of revelations that he had received. And he said, Lest I be exalted above measure, there was given unto me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. And then he said in verse 8, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And, you know, I think about people who are in the midst of a storm or a trial or, or, or life is not going as planned or expected. And, and they say, you know what, I've been praying about it. I've been reading my Bible. And yet, 
I don't see any change. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we all want God to say yes when we pray to him, that, you know, he'll relieve our burdens or whatever may be before us. And Paul said, look, I've, I've asked God three times, and his response is, my grace is sufficient. In effect, God said no. So how do you counter those who say, well, God said no, that means he doesn't care. Right. Well, you know, it's his own son. He cared about him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And yet his own son, talk about suffering. Wow. Jesus Christ suffered the horrific scourging that was brought upon him uh, before his, a nail was ever driven through his hands to fasten him to a cross or his feet to fasten him to a cross. He was slugged and beaten and spit upon and slapped and scourged and uh, mocked and ridiculed and his death didn't come by lethal injection. And, and you know what, BJ, you just triggered a thought in my mind. I, I'm sorry to no hit, hit the pause yes, button sir. because I want you to go back with what you yeah. But it just occurred to me, you know, Jesus in the garden prayed three times. My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. But in Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible says he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death. Right. The Bible says he was heard. But the answer wasn't yes. There's another way. No. His only begotten son had to go through suffering. So why should I get a, an exemption from all suffering? Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, All that would live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And Paul, what do you know about it? Well, he knew a lot about it. In fact, I, I was privileged just recently to go on a Bible Lands tour, and it hit me as we rode from place to place in an air-conditioned bus and got off the bus and spent a few minutes looking at some of the sights. Paul walked a lot of those miles that we traveled by air-conditioned bus. And then we went to four or five-star hotels that had been arranged for us by the tour company that set this all up to sleep in a nice, comfortable bed and to have breakfast provided and meals at night. And here is the Apostle Paul experiencing all this trouble and turmoil. And what does he do, quit on the Lord? No. He, he just keeps on tenaciously clinging to God and serving Him. And which, which I think, and, and, and by the way, in, in light of what you just said, doesn't, doesn't the Lord show Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 the benefits to his suffering? Right. B because ultimately what, what the Lord was saying is, you know, here's what I want you to do, Paul, and that is absolutely depend upon me come what may. Right, and you know, pain can actually have some benefits. For example, if I put my hand on a hot stove and I feel no pain, my hand could burn off without my even knowing it. The, the, the sensation of That's pain right. makes me draw away from what would hurt me even more. That's right. And so I might have a pain in my side that makes me go to the doctor. That pain might enable that doctor to find something that was going to kill me if it had been allowed to continue without detection. So That's pain right. can sometimes be a positive thing in alerting me to something that is going to kill me. That's and right. so this is a, it can be a blessing sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, BJ, you mentioned the sufferings of Paul. And in our day and time, Christianity has become somewhat of the whipping post of the liberal media, Hollywood, et cetera. And, and so Christianity is under attack, so to speak. And, and the idea of having to suffer for the cause of Christ. And what really stands out to me about the teaching of Jesus, he was very transparent, upfront, when it came to what to expect, the expectations of Christianity. Matthew chapter five, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. Uh, he, he, he didn't pull any punches. And, and I think about, you know, how many times today when somebody's offering a, a, a service or a product, they'll talk about the benefits, and then down in that little caption below, they've got in the small, small, small print yeah. disclaimers. The Lord didn't do that. No. He was right up front. And, and so 
what about the possibility of suffering for our faith and, and how, the, how the apostles viewed that? I love what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 18. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. Word. Paul, are you going to reap any benefits from all this suffering that you've done? He says, look, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, right. which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, but not to me only, right. but to all who love his appearing. In James chapter 1, blessed is the man when he's been tried, because afterwards, what does he get? He gets the crown of life, life. according to James 1, uh, 12. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, that crown of life is not just for Paul or not just for James, but it's for anyone for that's willing to be a, a child of God and love His appearing. That's right. B.J., you mentioned a child of God. To those who are suffering, who are not children of God, what would a person need to do to become a child of God and to enjoy the blessings of God's presence, the privilege of prayer, yeah. the opportunity to be pardoned? What would that person need to do? Oh, I'm glad you asked that because one of the most... Uh, tormenting things we could go through is guilt and it just takes a toll on us physically. We can have our guilt removed by the blood of Jesus Christ and if we will believe He is the Son of God as Peter confessed Him to be in Matthew 16, 16 and if we're willing to believe that to the point of repentance and remember that uh, if we don't per repent we'll perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5 and then if we'll take what we know about Jesus and boldly declare it like the eunuch did, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, that is penitent, confessing believers, we're now ready for the next step, which was to go down into the water, right. to come up out of the water, and to go on our way rejoicing as the eunuch did in Acts 8. Why was he so joyful? Well, his sins had been washed away by the blood of Christ, Acts twenty two sixteen. just like Saul's were when he was willing to arise and be baptized to wash away his sins. That's how you call on the name of the Lord. And so those blessings are ours to enjoy. And then once we become his children, uh, we have the avenue of prayer to keep on cleansing us if we stumble and fall. Right. What a blessing it is to be his children. You know, B.J., I can't imagine going through life with all the trials and troubles that we face. I can't imagine going through uh, the experiences of everyday life without God. Amen. We need so it. thank you so much, and thank you for being a part of our program. Hope to see you right back here next week. Until then, God bless you. Morning when this prison bars are broken, we shall rise. We shall rise. Glory, revive us again.